It's 90.3 FM KEXP here in Seattle, streaming online all over the world at KEXP.org. My name is Morgan. Very glad to be here with you in the live room right now. Very excited to be joined by Kelly Finnegan and the Atonements. Welcome, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Take it away.
different story of him. Oh, I'm bit, I'm keeping him with me, yeah. Cause my faith is strictly for him. Well, I tell you. Finnegan and the Atonements live here on KEXP. The new album, The Tales People Tell, just came out this past April on Coal Mine Records, one of my favorite albums of the year. So, so good. We're Thank so you. happy to have you here. Thank you. It's truly a pleasure. Oh, so great. Uh, Kelly, you've been in the group Monophonics for about a decade now, over a decade. This is it's your about nine years now. About nine years. Yep. And this is your first solo record. Yep. What was the inspiration to uh, cut your own record? It really didn't start off as a planned solo record. I was just writing songs, uh, just creating music, which I like to just do. I like to stay active and write. And I was just writing some songs. I wrote, I don't want to wait. I really dug it. I didn't know if it was going to be for me or if it was going to be for Monofont. You know, I, I just write for a lot of different people. And then I wrote Trouble. And then I wrote, I'll never love again. And then I think something came after that. I think Max showed me impressions of you. So as we started, you know, once I had like a handful of songs, I was like, oh, <laughs> light bulb, you yeah. know? And I called Terry over a coal mine, and I kind of was like, yeah, I got these songs. Played him some of it, and it was like, all right. Yeah. We, we, got, we got four. We got five. Let's, let's round it out and get to 10, 10, 12. So 
it really started off as just writing music. It was a lot more kind of just unplanned, kind of scattered. And then after I got a, a handful of songs, it turned into a very focused kind of like, okay, I'm making a record. So. Mm -hmm. And you wrote and produced the whole record. You played a ton of instruments on the record. You're a multi-instrumentalist, and uh, you come from a musical family. Your father, Mike, is a, a very prominent keyboard player, toured with huge artists, Jimi Hendrix, Joe Cocker, Etta James, Taj Mahal. Can you talk about growing up in that kind of, of musical family and, and how it sort of led you to the music that you make today? Um, it's kind of just one of those things that you don't realize that you're around these incredible people, at a James, like you said, just you're around these incredible people and you just hear these names in your house. You see Earl Palmer calls the house. I don't know if anybody knows who Earl Palmer is. He's like one of the most recorded drummers, one of my favorite drummers, but little things like that. It's just, and then as you get older and you figure out who these people are, you're kind of blown away. Um, and then when you, once I got into the business and really, you know, then you're like, wow, I've, I'm really fortunate. I've been able to see people do it at the highest level. I've seen people I've seen what it takes because like all these people, what they have in common is like a great worth work ethic and sac, you know, it's like music is first. That's one thing I figured out young, which was like, if you want to do this, you want to make this work. It's really hard to be over here doing this and that and really, and really make it work. So right away, I would say that's the biggest thing I took from it was my dad's work ethic and just being exposed to these artists and seeing how committed they were to the music and just just growing as artists and um i think it just naturally i think i just have the bug you know what i mean i think it, it's i got the gene i fell in love with music it's all i wanted to do you know i figured that out by the time i was 14 15 years old I was like i knew i knew what i wanted to do i didn't i didn't know i was going to do this i was never like i want to be in a band it was all very much like i want to just make records i want to produce i want to engineer i want to write so it was an amazing you know like i said the older i get and the deeper I get into the business, the more lucky I feel the fact that I was just able to witness so much greatness and just be around people who really did rub off on me, I think so. Mm -hmm. And I assume there were just instruments everywhere around you. Did you ever take lessons or were you just picking things up and trying them and, and realizing that you could do this? I took a couple drum lessons because that was like the first thing I wanted to play. I was just constant. This was me in class. Yeah. And my teachers were like, Kelly, stop, <laughs> stop on your desk. And then when they told my parents that, they're like, oh, that's, that's the biggest problem you have with them? Oh, okay, we'll, we'll get them a drum set. So I took a few lessons. Um, you know, I got like, I was into music at a young age, and then I got way into sports. And I think I was more of a natural athlete than a natural musician, you know, because as a kid, we were just talking about this. Like, it's hard. You, you have to be terrible at your instrument for some time, <laughs> you know? It's like, unless you're just naturally gifted and you just have it. But I think that was frustrating at a young age. I wasn't ready to put that time in. And I was very ADHD <laughs> all over the place. Like, oh, I want to go outside, I want to do this. So yeah, there was instruments, music everywhere, but it really wasn't until I was a, like a young teenager that I was more attracted to the studio and the gear. And I got really heavy into like sampling and you know just hip hop production and and that 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 kind of was like what really made me fall in love with like wanting to wanting to make music was was really hip hop music that's i would my my path to today started started with hip hop so awesome when did you realize you can sing because your voice is insane well thank you i <laughs> i think like everybody you like listen to yourself on an answering machine and you're like that's terrible <laughs> That's what I sound like when I talk. So I, did, I never sang. I never opened my mouth. My parents made me sing in a choir when I was younger just to kind of be like, yo, meet some people, see if you like this. And I actually had a good time. I was just so shy. Mm -hmm. um, but when people would, like, put me in a situation where I would perform for, like, a school talent show or something, I would always – once I was on stage, I was good. But I was just it, really shy and kind of just – you know, I didn't have any confidence. Getting up there and performing as a kid, it's, it's scary. So I started late. I started singing like 28, 29. I've only wow. been singing like 10 years. And that was just a thing where my dad is an incredible singer. I mean, Jerry Wexler called him to make a record with him. Wow. People don't know Jerry Wexler. That's who produced Ray Charles, Aretha Franklin, yeah, Bob Dylan, lots of people. So my dad's a fantastic singer. And I think that was just 
he was never discouraging. He actually, when he would hear me kind of humming around the house as a kid, he'd be like, oh, you got a good voice. You, you, but you just, you're like most kids, you don't want to be your parents. I think because my dad played keyboards and sang, I was like, I don't want to do that. <laughs> He's good. He's got that covered. Yeah. I want to be over here doing this, doing my own thing. So it's, it's pretty funny and ironic that here I am doing <laughs> exactly the same thing. But, yeah, I mean. But you're very good at it. Well, thank so. you. And I, I told Dan, it's like for anybody who wants to do this, you just do it. Because the, the only way to get better is doing it and, and getting that positive reinforcement. That's huge for anybody who plays an instrument. Like the first time someone comes up to you after a gig or, you know, I mean, we all remember those moments where you like you put yourself out there. You make yourself vulnerable and people respond to it in a positive manner. That's, a, that's important for mm -hmm. performers. So if you see a young performer, be encouraging because that's. That's important for that person. That's going to help them grow and, and get the confidence they need. Totally. It keeps you doing the thing you love and yeah. making sure that you don't give up on the thing that you love. Exactly. Yeah. And, and like I said, you, people just need, you just got to uh, be as encouraging as you can to young people, especially now. I feel like less and less, you know, young people want to be, uh, what were we saying? Tastemakers and influencers right. and gamers. Famous you know right I mean? away. It's like Famous a different right vibe away, yeah. when you ask a young person, like, what do you want to do when you grow up? It's like a. So anytime we see young people like that kid playing the drums, like, that's, that's cool. Hopefully that yeah. little man becomes a drummer one day. So. Totally. Um, I wanted to ask you so you, your record's out on Coal Mine, which, for context, uh, a couple of our great local bands here in Seattle, the True Loves, Jason, your trombone Jason. players in the True Loves, uh, Dove on the More Organ Trio. Um, and they're sort of following in the footsteps of Stax and bringing that really classic soul sound with brand new bands. What do you think it is about soul music that keeps coming back in the last 10 or 15 years that's made a, a resurgence? And, and you were talking about how you were very interested in hip hop. What is it about soul that made you land on that sound? Too. Well, there's soup. I mean, there's hip hop in so many old records. When you hear things, you're just like, that's hip hop. That's, you know, it's just yeah, soul music. Yeah, soul, jazz, funk, rare groove, Afrobeat. All those, all those musics that live under that umbrella are definitely connected to hip hop. Obviously, disco as well. Um, I don't know. It's kind of interesting that it, in a sense, it kind of did go away. And I think that came with a lot of like what how people were making records and how records sounded because people have been making R&B and soul records, but it's gone through the period of, you know, the 80s R&B into the 90s R&B into neo soul into just all these little, you know, sub genres of R&B and soul. But it's nice to see that because of, you know, Poets of Rhythm and of course Daptone Records and, and camps like that, that they've really... I think it takes someone to do it right for people to figure out like, oh, if I do it, if we, if we do it like this, it feels honest and it feels real. And that's, I think soul music is like the most, it's the realest music out there because it's just, it's such like common subject matter. It's like love, heartbreak, I'm in love, I'm out of love, I'm hurting. <laughs> Drinking. I'm feel yes, <laughs> I, we're having a good time, we're partying. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's just, I don't know, it's, a, it's such a special genre, and it, and it probably sounds not like, well, you love the music. Some people might be like, oh, it just sounds like Motown music or old people music, but there's definitely just a, for me, and I think for everybody in this room, it's, it's just a feeling. It's a, it's a special genre, and I don't know. I, I wish I could, I get that question a lot, like, why is this happening? I think what you're seeing now is like just a new generation of people who have been inspired by, you know, the Sharons and the, and the Charles and the Lees right. and, and the older generation of folks who have been doing it for a while mm -hmm. and kind of just figuring it out, uh, you know, slowly like, oh, okay, this is the path to, to making good soul music. Because yeah. I will say, just like anything, there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, I don't know, I think everybody in the room understands, like, there's just something about soul music. It's tough because there's a lot of people doing it, but there's just, in my opinion, there's only a handful who are really, like, doing it the right way. And obviously, we're talking about art. We're talking about music. There's no wrong way, but there is a feeling you want to give people, you know, with this music. So 
I know what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. You, we're on the same page. Yeah. So like I said, your your main group has been Monophonics. Yep. Um, and you have this this solo record out now. So you're doing a little bit of touring on it. And you've assembled a live band, The Atonements. Can uh, you can you tell us who's with you today of in course. this room? Um, I'm very lucky to have this group of people, um, incredible, talented musicians from all around the country, friends of mine, people I've met throughout the years through Monophonics and just wanted to always work with. Right here from the Bay Area, this is Kamiko Joy. She's a fantastic singer in her own right. And uh, she's been singing on Monophonics Records for years now and is on my record and has just been a, an important part of, of my sound. And Vivica Hawkins, who's a good friend of mine, I've known longer than anybody here, amazing vocalist as well. Her and Kamiko just have a really special thing. I think people pick up on that pretty fast at the show. There's just a, a thing they have between each other. Right here, like you said, the Seattle, the hometown hero from the True Loves, <laughs> Mr. Jason Cressy on the trombone. I've known Jason, Jason a while. He's played with Monophonics. Incredible. Like I said, everybody here is really could truly be doing something bigger than this. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm honored. Paul Chandler from Portland, incredible trumpet player, plays with uh, March 4th Marching Band and producer, DJ, a lot, always has his hands in a lot of stuff and is quite the... Um, DIY, uh, he's been fixing up his house and it's amazing. Nice. He, yeah, we went yesterday. We we're like, damn, bro, you need to. <laughs> I'm gonna buy. I'm gonna buy a fixer upper and get you down here. Professional. Right here, we have one of two Ramies. This is Mr. Joe Ramey. Joe is a co-writer on a handful of songs off the record, including "Catch Me I'm Falling." Incredible guitarist from a soul band called the Ironsides. You may have heard of Gene Washington and the Ironsides, which is another coal mine act. Uh, known Joe seven years now. And we've been making music, and yeah, this is his little brother Max on bass, another big important collaborator. Max is another co-writer on a lot of the songs on the record. Um, from the Ironsides, once again, just like, to me, when people would come and talk about monophonics and be like, oh, what soul bands, what, who in the Bay Area is doing soul music that you like? I would always say the Ironsides. That was like my favorite band in the Bay. Um, and they have some future music coming out, some great music coming out soon uh, that we're working on. And my man right here from Staten Island, New York, and from the infamous Mighty Mighty Dap Kings, Mr. Joe Crispiano. Uh, Joe is a delight. He's kind of like, he keeps everybody in high spirits. He keeps everybody smiling. That's how I feel it. He just brings a beautiful vibe. And of course, last but never least, the drummer, the most important part of this kind of music. Fantastic drummer from... California by way of Arizona, Mr. Dan Ford. So he's been playing with the Ironsides for a long time. So that's how I found him. And like I said, I'm, I'm truly lucky to have this group of people. So it is truly a super group in this room right now. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm a lucky guy. Awesome. Uh, so Monophonics are coming to Seattle playing Nectar Lounge on Saturday, August 10th. So folks can go see you then. Uh, we'd love to hear a couple more songs, though, from yes. your new record. And I will say with Monophonics, there's mm -hmm. a new record coming. Oh, perfect. So that'll be coming on Coal Mine as well. Do you know when? Are you allowed to say? Early next year. Early next year. Early next year. Okay. Definitely first quarter of next year. And so please come out. To, to, to the nectar because we'll be playing some new music for you. So fantastic! For that. Yeah, it's Kelly Finnegan and the Atonements live here on KEXP. I don't want to wait. Cool. No, no. 
Kelly Finnegan and the Atonements live here on KXP. I wish you could just play the rest of the record right now. <laughs> I do too. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here Thank with us. Thank you so us. much. It's really a pleasure. This is, everybody here realizes this is like one of the best radio stations in the world. So it's an honor for us to be here to play music for you. Thank you for having us. Super appreciate you making the time on your, uh, your little journey up and down the West Coast. Yep. And we'll see you again when you're back in town at the Nectar Lounge. People can go check out Monophonics playing Saturday, August 10th. Go pick up Kelly Finnegan's new album, The Tales People Tell. It came out in April. There's no way that's not on my top 10 this year. Wow, so, thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, and have a great rest of your tour. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's KEXP Seattle. Discover new music at listenerpoweredkexp.org.